<laughs> Welcome everyone to our inaugural GSE Pi Day Career Panel. And thank you to our esteemed panelists and guests for being here. Um, I think what I'm going to do is first just let each of the panelists introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the current roles that they're working in. I've given them some questions to think about before today, so I'll ask them those questions and have each of them respond to that, and then we'll take your questions from the audience, which I'm sure you have tons, right? Okay, great. So, <laughs> Molly, how would we start with you? Uh, yeah, so my name is Molly Crofton. I graduated from Penn's IEGP program in 2013, and I now work at uh, Research for Action, where I am a senior quantitative researcher. Um, and so I'm involved in four to six projects at a time doing all education-based research, some Philly stuff, some around the country, um, kind of playing different roles on the different projects, but that's where I am now. Great. Hi, I'm Caroline Ebby. I um, am a senior researcher at CPRI, which is here at GSE. It stands for the Consortium for Policy and Research and Education. And I'm also, and so I do research there on uh, math education, and I'm also an adjunct professor at GSC in the teacher education program, and I've taught elementary math methods for the past 20 years at GSC. And I'm also a grad of GSC. I got my doctorate many years ago. Jason. Uh, my name is Jason Presley. I'm the Vice Dean of Finance and Administration here at GSC. And um, in that role, I oversee the budget and the finance, the facilities, the uh, information technology team, and human resources, and payroll, and what else? A few other things. <laughs> uh, most of the non-academic related things uh, that, that are in the school. And uh, I also do some teaching in the school in the higher education department. Uh, I teach the economics of higher education. I am Manuel Gonzalez Canche. I'm, I am an associate professor at the Higher Education Division. I currently teach classes related to quasi-experimental design, quasi-causation, um, statistical network analysis. Um, I do research that involves kind of, I would like to describe it as kind of innovative identification strategies using math using matrix manipulation to identify groups that can be compared, uh, that are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, and uh, for whose outcomes may, may be different given that identification uh, strategy. Uh, I rely on special econometrics mostly for that identification strategy based on distance, based on proximity to other entities, and entities can take many forms and shapes, um, what else? Uh, I think that, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> important. <laughs> okay, great. Joe? Uh, my name is Joe Suzelski. I'm a senior research associate at the Philadelphia Youth Network. And so PYN is an organization that focuses on sort of connecting different players across the city to ensure that uh, young people have access to education and employment opportunities. Um, and so my role there has shifted a lot over time, but uh, most recently, it's it's really kind of focused on um, analytics, um, a lot around kind of providing information to folks to help them make decisions, um, sort of doing a lot of data presentation, a lot of visualizations and um, things like that, um, trying to make sure that the, the sort of wealth of data that we have is accessible um, and provided so that folks can make sort of real-time decisions. So, Joe, maybe we'll start with you and work sure. our way back. The next question I had folks think about, and they've each addressed a little bit already, is mm -hmm. how does math play a role in your job? Yeah. So, I'd say most of the math I do is counting and division. Um, <laughs> so, it's a lot of, uh, right now our work um, is really kind of focused, like I mentioned, on making sure that the data that we have um, is presented back to folks so that they can use it in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so uh, a lot of times that is just kind of like giving them counts of participants in programs or, or percentages of people that have um, achieved a particular outcome. Uh, and that's mostly because that's 
uh, those are metrics that folks are kind of familiar with. Those are things that they're used to seeing on a regular basis. And then we work to um, push the envelope um, you know, ever so slightly um, to expand how folks think about data and what's, what's kind of possible. Um, so uh, that tends to be a lot of kind of like uh, developing visualizations, uh, building dashboards, um, and just, just a, a lot around tool development. Um, and things that uh, I really like to do, but don't get to spend enough time doing around sort of doing modeling um, or doing statistics and those kinds of things, I think um, are really exciting. But I think in my work, there's kind of this trade-off between um, uh, somewhat between accuracy and interpretability. And it, right now we're really on sort of the interpretability side, which is let's create things that, that folks can relate to um, and then kind of push the envelope to do more interesting, um, uh, more impactful statistics and those types of things as, uh, as there are opportunities for them. Okay, mm -hmm. well, how about you? Yes, um, yeah, I completely agree with with Joe in, in, in his statement in terms of the importance of visualization and in order to convey ideas that policy and decision makers can actually take to implement actions. Uh, my, my type of work, as I kind of mentioned, involves the identification of these groups can, that can be described from a, st a statistical point of view, uh, but the, the descriptive aspect kind of get lost in, in the type of work that I'm doing. Um, because for publication opportunities, uh, for um, peer review academic journals, they, they prefer yeah, descriptive table here and there, but then the inferential aspect of this. How can we extend our under understanding from this sample to the population if we are able to take another sample from the same population? that type of, of language. Um, so the way I use um, math, uh, very similarly, starts with, with these counts and, and divisions. Like how, for example, how can we measure college access in a given state? What is going to be the denominator? Is going to be the total number of high school graduates in May of this year? And who is going to be in the numerator? Uh, are individuals who go to college in the four-year sector, if that is the case, what about those who go to the, went to the two-year sector or the, to the for-profit sector? So it is a matter of how do we delimit our, our understanding of what these groups are, and for example, how different forms of aid, like loan, finance, uh, merit-based, need-based, may affect the variation of enrollment patterns across different sectors. But this, in reality, is, is mostly division, is <laughs> partitioning the data uh, so that it makes sense and can be replicated by, by other people. So uh, it goes much more to the fundamentals the, of mathematics, like mm -hmm. um, arithmetics, than, than to calculus, for example. Mm -hmm. like, once these groups have been created, then the inferential part comes in, takes comes into, uh, it takes uh, form into the modeling part. Okay. Okay. Um, well, for me, most of the math work that I did is really very basic arithmetic as well. A lot of, um, you know, revenues minus, minus expenditures is an <laughs> equation <laughs> that I look at, I look at a lot. Um, <laughs> And you know, just taking percentages of things certainly counts. Um, you know what what programs bring in, what revenue, things of that nature. Um, I think the more interesting part of my work beyond that um, currently has to do more with analysis um, and in sort of understanding the the parts that make up the whole and the interrelationships that exist, and um, you know answering a lot of what if scenarios. What if what if we did this? What would be the implications on the budget? What if we did that? What would be the implications? Mm -hmm. So so having facility with very basic kinds of Excel oriented models that are efficient 
in the sense that you can answer questions like that quickly as they came up uh, as they come up is probably the the uh, the sort of you know main main sense of math in, in my role I think. Okay. Caroline. So at first I thought the question was sort of funny, like how is math related to your, like I feel like everything I do is mm -hmm. related to math, I'm a math educator. Math isn't everything. <laughs> That's it, yeah. right? But, um, but actually listening to you all, I, um, you know, my work really focuses on building teachers' capacity to teach math in the lower grade, in grades K through eight. Mm -hmm. And so um, that may seem like I'm dealing with the simpler math, but really what I'm trying to do is help people understand how complex that is. Mm -hmm. um, and so building teachers' capacity to teach math means helping them understand the research around how children learn math. So that's a big focus of my work, to use that research on how kids understand math to inform how we teach math. Unfortunately, we haven't done a great job of doing that in this country, so there's a lot of work to be done around that. Um, so I, you know, I spend, but it's good to hear that the basic math is <laughs> the really important math, right? So, because that's what I'm trying to get people to learn. <laughs> Division is, I spend a lot of time on that. So I can talk about that forever. So, yeah, so it really, um, it surrounds everything I do, but I don't necessarily use math so much, mm. right, as think about it and, and work mm. with it and think about how kids learn it and mm. think about how complex something like, like I was, I, my current work is with grades K through two teachers and helping them see how complex like something like learning to count is, which seems very basic to us, but is actually quite mm -hmm. complex for a five-year-old, sure. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, can I match up then with, with <laughs> her on that? I'm, I'm just, it, it, you it's have a, a great, no. <laughs> well, I do, I do, and they, they're, you know, we're going through all that learning, yeah. but I, you know, it's interesting that that, it's always been interesting to me, the work you do, and you and yeah. Janine have, have talked about in front of the faculty before, mm -hmm. Um, because for me, like as a child, when I remember being a child, no, I didn't have a teacher that sort of was able to convey to me how math was all around me. Yeah. Or yeah. It, maybe I just didn't listen. I guess that <laughs> might have been a problem. But there was no good. There was no good connection until I got much older. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I, you know, learning to, to be able to think about how do you get that instilled in a teacher who's in the classroom, I think is you know that's super yeah. super important. And I remember learning multiplication, it was all memorization. Oh, right. Yeah. And then totally. when my kids started learning, you know, they had like blocks that they brought home and they had to divide it into different groups. Like, oh my God, that's amazing. Now they yeah. understand. Right. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. conceptual. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, Molly. Uh, yeah, so math and my job, um, I think it kind of runs the gamut of what, what though I'm not mm -hmm. teaching no. people how to, <laughs> how to add and yeah. things like that. But. Um, it can be anything from counting, looking at the survey, how many people said this versus this versus this, and then making it into a visual that people can uh, comprehend, or it can be uh, thinking about, so this is kind of what this program wants to do, how can we measure, how can we design a measurement that we can try to then approximate what they're trying to do and then kind of give them feedback on how well they're doing or how, how they can improve. Um, and sometimes it is then regression modeling, We're working with like designing an early warning system for a school um, to understand like students that are leaving their school, try to like figure out indicators for what, how could they identify kids who might be at risk for leaving and what, and then what can they do to support those students more to keep them around. So kind of from counting to regression kind of I think is about where I am. <laughs> <laughs> All in one day. So yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, so we'll go back this way again. Right. When, did, when did you first realize that you were good at math? <laughs> This and might want yeah. it to be a significant part of your day-to-day -day professional work. This is a hard one for That's me. That's okay. I think it's, it's the career counselor in me wanted to know. Yeah, because I don't know. I mean, when I was I was trying to pinpoint like a math class. I mean, it was long ago. It was definitely when I was a kid. I always like kind of gravitated to math, probably because my dad did as well, and he. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I remember. I very much remember like algebra being a switch in my mind, where it's like not just things I'm memorizing, not just like these contrived problems, but like a way to solve problems. And I think, I don't know if that's me reflecting back and realizing that's what I got from algebra, probably, but I hope that I saw that a little bit looking forward as a kid too. So I don't know, that would be, it was definitely when I was a, when I was a youngster. <laughs> cool, Caroline. So I have two answers to the question. The first part, when did I realize I was good at math was in first grade. Mm -hmm. um, because I was in a, a mixed first and second grade classroom, which was sort of the thing at the in the 70s, um, the new you know model, mm -hmm. and 
my teacher put me to work in math with the second graders and we got to work um, independently. And so I think that gave me the confidence, you know, I sort of like, you can do math, you can do this on your own, you don't need me to do it. And it, while it may sound like she recognized some sort of genius in me, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that all kids should have that experience of being told, you can do this, you don't need me, you, you know, and for me that was, I think, powerful, it helped me continue on and do well in math. When I realized I wanted to do it as a career was not until college. I did major in math in part because I just kind of kept taking courses and then when it came time to declare a major I had enough courses to do it and <laughs> thought I'll keep doing this. Sure. And there were very few women in, in math majors at the time and that seemed like a good, good thing to do. Um, but I remember really struggling in my higher level math courses which are so abstract to kind of, I would go to class and listen to the lecture and I'd kind of leave and go, I don't know what that was about, and I'd have to go home and make sense of it, and then it would make sense to me. And I would sort of remember thinking, well, you know, maybe, why did it have to be so hard? Like, couldn't they make sense of it from the beginning? <laughs> maybe I could be a teacher and help people understand this. Mm -hmm. So I went on to be a math teacher. So I taught middle school math when I, after I graduated from college and then went on from there. Okay. So sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah, well, that's great. Right. It's all part of the story. It made me think that my daughter is learning math said she didn't like math yeah. recently. Yeah. Yeah, and the teacher said, well, I'm sorry, but math likes you. Oh, there you go. Oh. Good answer. And it kind of, <laughs> and it kind of turned, and she kind of yeah. like, you know, she oh kind gosh. of like tilted her, um, yes. tilted her perspective a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it's a good answer, right? It is a good answer. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of funny. I, I don't think maybe I've realized it yet. But I'm on this math panel, so maybe I <laughs> um, No, I think for me, seriously, I mean, when I first kind of got the sense that maybe I'm better at math than some folks was in college, late, uh, somewhat of a late bloomer, and uh, I studied economics in, in college. And I got into economics because conceptually, um, economics just made sense of me. When I say conceptually, the idea you know, supplies, supply and demand and shifts in supply caused this to happen. Um, and I, that like all clicked with me and all my sort of peers in the class were like, ah, this doesn't make any sense to me, well, you know, and I'm like, well, how does it not, it's common sense. <laughs> um, and I had that outlook on it and then as I, you know, I, I majored in it and then as I got deeper into it, it started tying into understanding it in a mathematical sense. And that conceptual understanding that I brought to it um, just made the math kind of start to click and then I was able to follow the math in a way that I had never done it before and it became just a different a different kind of a tool for me mm -hmm. um, at that point and then you know then later in statistics it you know it it was just a way of, of explaining relationships I mean the relationships made sense to me and I could understand that and that there was just an application of measuring how strong relationships existed um, that sort of drew me into the math. Um. Great, thanks. Yeah. So I think that uh, I started to realize that I liked math and math liked me too. <laughs> <laughs> In high school, I went to a, to a very bad high school, like a very dangerous, very, like if you wear the wrong colors, it was going to be a mess. And there was a, no, a technical high school, not vocational, technical. Yeah, uh, my high school, uh, we were talking back in the southeast of Mexico, in the Yucatan. I, uh, my, my major in high school was physics and mathematics. Mm -hmm. So before then, I was okay with, with math. I, I actually didn't like it too much um, for at all. But then when I started learning calculus, the integral calculus, mm -hmm. it, it started like, oh, this actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember that we had the first exam and only two people passed, and it was one of them. <laughs> and then my, and it wasn't, wasn't popular or whatnot, but my, my, my uh, classmates started to ask me, so can you help us, can you help us with uh, tutoring us, tutoring us? And I said, Okay, so they came to, to my parents' house and we studied all night and they passed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it is because of, of that, but I didn't have to retake the exam because I, I was one of the two people who <laughs> passed. And then uh, 
uh, one of the professors opened up uh, a tutoring uh, academy, and she invited me to be a tutor. <laughs> and we were tutoring the wealthiest kids who were attending the best public school in, in, this, in, this, in the city of Media. Mm -hmm. And it was, what? I am tutoring these kids who are, mm -hmm. <laughs> who are supposed to be tutoring me. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started to uh, get. Uh, and then in, in the PhD, I, I had code names in, in Econ and in Biostats. And especially the Biostatistics, I was surprised how, how much they relied in that, in that field on calculus, uh, just making mm -hmm. kind of guesses about, they're talking about really microscopic things that cannot be even perceived. So they, the same way we make mathematical guesses mm -hmm. about astrophysics, about things that we can just imagine, mm -hmm. they do it, but at the micro, micro, microscopic level. So the connection in math, as, as we are talking, is everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so that's when it just um, like strengthened my, my love for this beautiful thing. You reminded me, I forgot to mention at the beginning, you may know that Stephen Hawking has passed yes, away today. I know. Yes. And I was so thinking about the so irony fitting. of yeah. him passing away on Friday, <laughs> which is also Albert Einstein's birthday. And then a colleague in town told me that he was born on the anniversary of Newton's death. Mm -hmm. Stephen Hawking was? Stephen Hawking. Because he was also, the, he's like the Isaac Newton professor at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I'm pretty sure he's here with us right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the probability of all of that? Yeah. <laughs> probability, exactly. All right, Joe. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I would agree with Jason, which is like, I maybe still haven't recognized that um, <laughs> uh, I'm good at math. I, math was never really a part of my identity, um, necessarily, but, or being good at math, I guess I should say, wasn't a part of my identity, but I think um, in my current role, I've, I have realized that there was sort of an opportunity to start to bring in some of the, the principles, the ideas associated with that, that could potentially have, um, you know, a, a, a substantial impact on the work that we're doing. So for me, it's always been kind of being motivated by um, applications of whatever ideas or, 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 or principles um, trying to trying to find ways to put them into practice, make connections between different things, um, and like Caroline said, um, you know, a, the the abstract concepts often don't really click for me. But but I spend a lot of my time just kind of thinking about how data is organized, um, trying to to get it in a format which makes sense, and so that has led me to learn a lot about computer programming and uh, you know trying to learn more about the ways in which math underlies those those concepts. Um, uh, trying to learn more about um, statistics and regressions and, and, and modeling and those types of things um, and, and find ways that, that they can sort of um, change the way that folks are making decisions or, or the ways that, that, that practitioners think about their work. That's sort of always been um, my focus. Uh, and so that, I think that's what, that, what, that's what has been kind of exciting for me is thinking about applications of these different ideas and trying to find ways to put them into practice. And I, I would consider my, my math um, understanding as being sort of wide and, and shallow. Um, <laughs> yeah. I like that. Great. All right, so do you have a favorite math class? And if so, what did you like the most yeah. about it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll start randomly. But we'll make sure that no, one <laughs> no one has a favorite math <laughs> class. No one has a favorite math class. Or favorite category math classes. I think I would say, uh, in my case, was also in the PhD in the sociology department, was the advanced statistical modeling class that they have. I really, really struggled a lot in that class. Yeah. I struggled so much that I remember that the first exam that we had. I was stuck in the first problem, and it was just, I don't know why, like a 45 minutes exam. I do remember that. <laughs> 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 and it was, there were like five questions, I was spending about 35 minutes in the first question. And he said, there is no way I'm going to, and 
bad strategy because I, I instead of skipping to the next one, I just got stuck with that one. And then uh, the professor was not even in, in the class, in the classroom. So he sent the, the TA because nobody finished in 45 minutes. And the TA said, OK, you have had um, 30 more minutes. And I said, OK, let's uh, breathe. <laughs> let's try to do it however you can and just just get it over. With. So I finished that exam and I was completely sure that I I failed totally. So my strategy was that was the first exam. I'm not going to even look at what grade I got in that <laughs> exam. I just need to continue moving and I'm going to try to ace the second and ace the third and ace the the take home exams and blah blah blah. So I ended up with an A. And to this day, <laughs> I, I don't. I have never looked at. <laughs> that, 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 that oh my gosh! I don't know which one was it. <laughs> but that's when when I realized that I'm not here because of the grade. I'm just mm -hmm. here because I really want to learn ah, this yeah. concept, and regardless what what mm -hmm. grade was. Good. All right. Who next? Well, um, I don't know if this is fair, but my favorite math class honestly is the one that I teach um, <laughs> at GSE. So um, in my methods class, and I have um, students who are in the graduate program for teacher education, um, we do a problem of the week. So every week I give them a problem to do at home. And they come into class, we start every class by discussing how they solve the problem and sharing and spend um, about 20 to 30 minutes discussing the different solution strategies and it's just it's amazing how many how fun it is to just and these are pretty um, they're what we call low floor high ceiling problems so you can solve them you know and take it anywhere you want and usually as a group we take it pretty far mm -hmm. um, and so I've been doing this as I said for almost 20 years and so and I use the same problems year after year so you would think like oh I get bored of it and, but it's amazing how every year it's different and somebody comes up with something that I never thought of really mm -hmm. or that we had never talked about and so um, I could really spend the whole class it's a three-hour class we could spend three hours on it I have to mm -hmm. limit it to mm -hmm. 20 minutes because we need to do other things in the class mm -hmm. but um, to me that's what math should be like and that's why we do it so that they have a vision of math that's different from what they might remember from college <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> high school <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say it's hard for me to pinpoint one too but when I when I started my master's degree in economics I started that and I had only taken business calculus as an undergrad in a business school and they were like, well, you've got to take a real calculus class. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I had, so I enrolled in this, in this community college um, in a calculus class, and the professor was excellent. He was a fantastic teacher. And uh, he brought the, the calculus, he just made it very real um, and understandable, and it, and it was like it was like what I was talking about earlier, as I had sort of gotten through an undergrad degree in economics without really knowing the math, and then seeing the calculus and really kind of learning, it was like it it just clicked open a whole different way of seeing um, just all the relationships and the the value of understanding that kind of math and the you know ability to whatever measure the area under a curve, you know, yeah. and what that means in economic terms. Um, and it's like, oh wow, that's why I needed to have this, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd say that one. Mm -hmm. well, the other thing I'd say about math classes is, and especially when they're applied in a certain subject, is just how how interrelated things are, and you you may not even realize you're learning something when you're learning it until you're much you know totally different context in a, mm -hmm. in a different way, and it, that thing from the past clicks into you, clicks into your mind of like, and it opens it up in a different way spurred by something completely different which is I, for me a really um, interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. in how I've learned. And that's actually what I was going to say I felt like I would be cheating but it's more like the applied math courses that I think I've really that, where it, it really sinks in that much more um, so I was actually electrical engineering in undergrad and I remember just those like intro circuit design courses it wasn't like complex math you were doing but like because there was the application to it it just made so much more sense 
um, kind of seeing the pieces together and then being able mm -hmm. to like use it to like really apply it to something that you want to be doing. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I would I would definitely echo that too. I I remember taking statistics early on in graduate school and and also in undergrad and feeling like you know I I spent some time teaching after undergrad and feeling like when I was in graduate school I was like thinking way more about how I could sort of use these principles and, and uh, it, it felt more relevant to what I wanted to be doing in my career mm -hmm. um, rather than just sort of like this heavy conceptual idea. So. Great. All right. One more question before we open it up to our audience, which has now expanded by <laughs> what percent class? <laughs> okay. um, all right. So what career advice do you have for people who are good at math and passionate about education? Randomly, whoever. Um, so I have, I have two thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. One is, uh, you know, not to necessarily get too focused on a position being a math-oriented position, but finding ways to kind of implement those skills or principles or mindsets into whatever position it is you find yourself mm -hmm. in. That's certainly okay. the approach that that I took. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so it's just kind of like trying to bring that, that mindset, those scales to, to whatever. And the second is to, um, in my experience, learning a programming language is like one of the most important things that I've done to be able to really um, apply those ideas in, in sort of efficient, reproducible ways. Um, I use R in my current work and I did a little bit of state in undergrad or in graduate school, um, but it has been um, by far one of the most important skills that I've learned in, in my current work. Okay. Great. Could you please repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Career advice for people who are good at math and passionate about education. Well, I would, I, I mean, I would definitely echo the computer language, um, in terms of career advice, just because, um, I mean, there's so many applications. I mean, especially with the stat with the stat package. I mean, you can do it in in, uh, in education policy. Certainly, you can do it in academia. Um, you can teach others to do it. I mean, so there's lots of applications um, for that. And then there, I mean, there are tons of applications beyond education. I mean, you did say passion about education, but in terms of career advice, just solely career advice, having that skill set that's applicable to many different things gives you many different types of opportunities. Um, so I guess that's the main thing I would say. Um, okay. So I think my advice, um, if you're interested in math and interested in education, there is work to be done. There <laughs> is a lot of work out there. My experience has been, um, it's, there's a high demand for that skill set. and. Um, there aren't a lot of people out there who have expertise in math and education, and um, there's a great need for it. Um, most people who are good at math end up going to different careers. You know, it's not necessarily in education. So, um, I, my own experience has been where I've been in a position to be able to pick and choose what I want to do because there's a lot of work out there, and I'm able to say no to things. You know, because rather than having to, to, you know take whatever's out there. I think that um, I say go for it. <laughs> um, and I would also echo um, the one thing I wish that I, you know, sort of did is take more statistics. So even though I was a math major and I never took, that was sort of like applied math, you know, you didn't take statistics. Um, and so I took basic of math statistics, but I never took the applied courses and it would be really helpful in my job now as a researcher to have that skill set. I, you know, wish that I had that. So again, I think that's that's a um, a skill set that we prize highly in in the work that I do now and are always looking for people with that. So it's, uh, it's particularly people who not just can do the math but can understand how to apply it to a social, you know, situation that isn't so cut and dry and how to how to use statistics to um, to, to both, um, you know, measure, measure things, but also communicate. Yeah. So. I, would, I would add, what yep. were you going to say? No. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, actually, 
probably all, not all of us, not me, but most people on this panel are probably quite good at this. But it, I think it's really hard to find someone who's really super good at math and super good at being able to just communicate mm -hmm. that uh, to most people that aren't good at math. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I've been very fortunate to have a couple of people in my life who are really excellent at both, and that mm -hmm. that really helped me. So as you are learning uh, uh, and and gaining math skills, don't forget to practice how to actually communicate that in a way where people can yes. kind of get it figured mm -hmm. out. Because, yes. I mean, you know, the the two smartest guys in the world can sit and talk, you know, really some great math, but nobody else knows what they're talking For about. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you know what good is that? I mean, there's some yeah. good to that, of course, right? But it's you know be, to be able to communicate um, is important. And just to add to that, I don't think you have to be super good at math to be able to uh, be a math educator. Yeah. We think about math and education That's and the role sure. of math and education. So it shouldn't be like a prerequisite because oftentimes the best, you know, people who understand the struggle and what it, you know, what's difficult about it can be better at. At thinking about its role mm -hmm. in education. I think I'd just echo programming language, no matter which one, like learning <laughs> and dig, digging in, and also echo um, the the expanding de demand and interest in people who can interpret data and use data and, and work with that in an education. So think about where you might want to sit within this world of education and math, whether it's like in a classroom or in a school or in a school district or in an academic institution or in another research organization or in, I mean, SDP has a bunch of just people who think about data and how they can work in the district. There are like so many different places you can sit. Mm -hmm. So kind of, uh, I think I only understood that more once I like had this research job, seeing that there's so much going on with data and analysis in education and that's growing and there's growing demand for it so think about whether you would want to be doing kind of research in what setting you'd want to be doing your your math and analysis more okay last but not least mm -hmm. yeah i also take a little bit of issue with the the wording of the question in terms of good and math <laughs> um, right. in my previous uh, as carolyn mentioned uh, in my previous uh, work i part of the classes that I was charged with offering were fundam was fundamentals of statistical modeling. And it was at the PhD level in higher education. And I take pride, and I'm very, very, very proud of that, that typically students were terrified about taking the <laughs> test. <laughs> and I, say, I, I was mentioning, I also rely a lot on, on data visualization for the, the black box and R is, is amazing for that. What is happening in the black box and how can you simulate when the T converges to the Z and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, I take pride in saying that these students not only pass the class but ace the class and continue taking other statistical classes. Um, now I, that's something that I kind of miss because I'm, I'm not offering fundamentals of statistical model anymore. I offer uh, quasi-experimental design, as I mentioned, and I offer statistical network analysis. And this is the very first time in, in since I have been in the academic profession that I opened the statistical network analysis part to master's students. And actually, Diane here in the audience took mm -hmm. that class as a master's student. And I am also very proud that, that all the students ace the class, basically. <laughs> So, and it's a hard class. We are not only learning the notions behind uh, graph theory, graph modeling, um, network visualization, but also learning R at the same time, because that's the tool that we use mm -hmm. in the class. And I, I, co I continue to uh, keep telling them, this is going to be either the easiest class or the most difficult class, because <laughs> if you do the assignments, we don't have exams, if you do the assignments right after the class, you have the code fresh in your mind and you have taken notes. You're going to be able to replicate the exercises with the data set I'm going to provide you with. But if you wait one week before the deadline, is, there is no way that we're going to finish. There are going to be a lot of issues <laughs> for you to load the data or to clean the data or to do this and that and that. And it's not going to converge, it's not going to be able to. So I would say I wouldn't be here if it was not because of math and statistics. Um, I will be probably back in my head.
home country. Mm -hmm. So career-wise, I would say just expose yourself to be uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I know that some statistical or statistics professors take pride in failing students. <laughs> that's what you and that's happening. Mm -hmm. Not here, or but typically that that's yeah. okay. I am by all means not not one of, of them. I'm mm -hmm. sure that um, uh, all who are here uh, share this n this love for for trying to help. So the take students. his class, is yeah. <laughs> 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 <That's right. laughs> And finally, Caroline, the, the, you have the foundations. It is not never too late to, to learn. Right. Okay, yes. I will. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one last spontaneous question. I think we would be remiss if we didn't give a shout out to your favorite math teacher or mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. You're vastly overestimating your memory, memory power. <laughs> 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 Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, <laughs> what class? Uh, algebra. Algebra. Yeah, algebra Mom. and geometry. So, yeah. Mom, Mr. Clark, algebra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, mine was Dr. Duval. She was a calculus, my calculus teacher, mm -hmm. and I thought it was really cool that she was a doctor of math and a woman mm -hmm. to That's do calculus, right. so, yeah. Um, I guess I'd say Fran stayed. She was my, my uh, chair, my dissertation chair, and helped me through um, a lot of that. Although I would also say my colleague, David Ventenner, was not a teacher per se, not in a classroom. Oh, not formal, but. But I worked with him, and he taught me every day something about math, and, mm -hmm. you know. He was a great mathematician. Okay. I would say um, at least two. Um, Doctor Who, but it's the yeah. Doctor Who with H U. Doctor Chen Chen Hu. Uh, he was my minor advisor in the value stats. Um, the favorite class I took with him was analysis of high dimensional data, which is basically just big data analysis, analysis of big data. Um, the late Professor Scott Eliason, who is this professor in sociology whose class I was about to <laughs> fail. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the, those are highly, highly influential mm -hmm. human beings I have met. Mm -hmm. Nice. Jeff. Well, I'm my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Tollerton. Mm -hmm. okay. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this is the portion of the program where you all ask questions. And you can either ask it to all of the panelists or if there's someone in particular. Well, um, I'll first off, thanks. Thank, thank you and Kim for coming out here. Um, I'm sure it was a pie that got us all here. Right? <laughs> yes. um, I can smell I've kind of just, you guys touch upon a lot of things, so I'm going to try to put this wrong. And I know it's a very diverse panel here, so yeah. if something doesn't pertain to you, don't feel the need to ask it. But I guess it's wrong with, you know, it, it, we're going to ask this in very many ways, but when has math fell short in terms of, like, what is the next opportunity for math and for death? From what you've seen in your in your professional atmospheres, if I may start um, going back to the identification process I was mentioning. So, for example, uh, one one of the the papers I have been working on, and thankfully was recently accepted, how far a given student should go to enroll in college for that student to have as good outcomes as the students who out-migrated out of the state or out-migrated within the state to attend college. And the models consistently show that the students who enroll within the five closest institutions do worse uh, nearby college. Um, I'm having, and however I, I slit, uh, section or partition the data set continuously Keep uh, that answer keep, keeps going. I think that I need to go and and do some more qualitative research mm -hmm. about that because mm -hmm. I can speculate however I want, but in that case, Mark has helped me identify a possible pattern mm -hmm. structure that is happening, but I don't have the reasons as to why mm -hmm. that is actually happening. I mean, yeah, so I would definitely echo that. Um, I do a lot of presenting um, analysis to uh, teachers, program managers, folks that are on the ground working directly with young people. Um, and the thing I always lead with is that I also began my career as a teacher, and I think that um, that really helps to break down barriers and um, 
it's always the mindset I kind of bring to the analytical work that I'm doing, like sort of thinking about how is this going to be useful to someone who's in front of a group of students or designing a, um, a program for young people who are trying to get their GED, right? So it's, it's kind of always bringing that mindset of like, what's the context behind the numbers? What are the things that are not being captured? How, is this, how can we sort of put this into practice? That sort of qualitative aspects. Um, and finding ways to marry that with the, with the quantitative sort of um, hard data has been, I think, um, for me, one of the most important things in, in, in getting folks to buy into the work. Um, I would say maybe a little bit about what Manuel's saying in a slightly different way. Um, in economic research, um, where does math fall short? Uh, well, it falls short in its predictive ability in many kinds of ways. I mean, who predicted the 2008 recession, right? Um, as a sort of an extreme example. But I think in social science, generally, when you apply math to something that's as complex as human dynamics and human behavior, you know, the truth doesn't lie in the math. And, you know, it can point you maybe in the right directions, it can point you um, towards more questions to ask, to more good questions to ask. Um, but you're, you know, don't don't confuse a research study, you know, based on a data set uh, that has some findings and some relationships as the ultimate truth in that sort of social situation. And I think that, especially as a young student studying, uh, it's very easy to sort of be like reference that piece of research with that finding, um, and then, well, you know, can we replicate that study and. You know, we don't really, that's not really how academic research, I mean, since the social science, it doesn't try to replicate things. Um, so I think there's, a, you know, a bit of a breakdown there. Yeah, I, I would want to echo that and build on that, in that Molly mentioned earlier that using data is a tremendous, you know, there's a tremendous focus on using data in education to make decisions, and um, there's this belief that once you put a number on something, it has meaning. And so, you know, people say, oh, we're 35% proficient. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Proficient in what? How are you defining proficiency? What is it, you know, when you're not proficient? You know, like, there's so much that you don't know from that number, but yet we put so much emphasis on that. And so I think that's a real, real problem right now. Um, and, you know, I've had teachers who have learned that, you know, to say, well, I gave, you know, I give five questions and if they get 80% correct, then they've mastered it. Like, wh why would that be the case? Like, just because you put a percent on it means something. Um, so we really have to question, you know, and not have that, that belief in just because we put a, a percent or a number on it, it has meaning, but what does that really mean? And I think that's what, what everybody's getting at. And I think then sometimes you get into these perverse incentives where you're just trying to like get that number higher when it's not actually yeah. making things better. Yeah. It's not actually helping. Yeah, it's for sure. And then you get these like cheating scandals where yeah. it's like so it's where you put too much pressure on that and not understand about the context behind it and what the bigger picture of of why you're choosing that number yeah. or why you're measuring that. Then do you find yourselves in an odd dichotomy then? Because if you're doing the analysis and coming out with the numbers you know, you may be the best person to represent whether or not to ask the question as to what's true that the numbers and not. But then you asking that question means that you're undermining your own numbers. <laughs> um, you know, but at least somebody's actually asking that question. You know, so do you find it that it's in your role is to actually just simply provide or to provide and ask or to provide and then draw others to ask that question? I think it's all of those things. But yeah. I think that sometimes the, uh, for example, a, a, a given academic paper in a journal can end with this finding, and you can say future research should expand upon this. Right. Mm -hmm. Or if you, I found that if you are applying for grant funding, for example, is is a good strategy to start with this identification strategy, and then say. The subsequent part of this overall project will be to dig in from qualitative uh, observations or interviews so that whatever number we found from the identification strategy can be actually understood, uh, the reasons as to why that is happening. And I found that 
that funding agencies like that approach mm -hmm. because they're providing a kind of like a full program of research for a given specific question. It never stops. Never. I mean, you're always asking more questions. Mm -hmm. I also think it, it speaks to something that Molly touched on earlier, which is that part of the work has to be figuring out like how are we measuring the thing that we are talking about mm -hmm. here, right? Because I think that's often the case is we like we use the things that we have good measurements on to make decisions instead of focusing on how can we measure mm -hmm. things that are things are differently. And in my case, a lot of it is about trying to um, measure more sort of like intermediate, um, shorter term, mm -hmm. um, what's happening in specific programs, what are the activities or services that are being offered, what are some of the, the you know, social emotional outcomes and those types of things that that might give us some leading indicators that a young person's gonna go on and be successful and transition to college or, or a high paying job and those types of things. So I think this focus can't just be on analyzing the data you have, but also being really clear about what data are you lacking, how is that data not of high quality, and trying to find better ways to measure that information. I think you touched on a good point, is that you know we're in a world right now where it's like the minute rice of analysis, like you know, <laughs> the, whether it's through like sports stats or through like mm -hmm. 538 or the upshot mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. like the money ball type stuff, where people have information readily available to them and it shows an immediate impact. While in research, it's much more like a crock pot type atmosphere where mm -hmm. you know you have to you do mm -hmm. a great amount of due diligence and you know even if the if whatever the numbers come out and say, there's still a lot of soft skills around qualitative analysis before you actually come up with the final product. First off, have you guys actually seen that? And what methods do you guys use to kind of temper the attitude, you know, until you actually come out with it with a viable result? Well, I would say, well, I would say, first of all, a lot of what you're talking about really varies by discipline. Um, I mean, in economics, there's nobody talking about qualitative research <laughs> in an academic level right and there it's very you know it's a very different kind of outlook and it's not there's not a lot of discussion around what does the measurement mean I mean it's like the measurement is a standardized test for quality period I mean that's the end of the discussion that's the mathematical measure we're going to use um, whereas in education we're going to talk about what does that mean in terms of quality is that a good measure is quality as defined by how someone scored on a standardized test actually quality um, and you would hopefully try to find something to to use to go along with that, you know. That, um, so I've just seen it in my experience both ways, where you've got fields that really do try to hash that stuff out, and fields that really are just more. It is what it is. The measurement is what the measurement is, and then the math is the math, and it's math, so it's true, and that's the that's this research project project. I also think your comment has brought to mind two things. One is that we really, there's a need to teach people to be consumers of, um, of mathematics, not just producers, right? And so all these things are out there in the media and we need to teach people how to make sense of those and to ask those questions like, what is this, what's the measure? <laughs> what is this really saying? Um, so that's a charge for education, but also the tension for us as researchers is in an academic environment there's a tremendous amount of time that we put into producing results and vetting them and getting them peer reviewed. And by the time they come out, it's like, you know, nobody cares anymore. Mm -hmm. We've moved on. Mm -hmm. And the world today is moving so fast and right. media is putting things out there right away. But if we do that, then we're compromising the academic mm -hmm. process of making sure things are, are solid before we put them out and peer reviewing. So I think that's a constant tension. That's something at CPRI. Um, I think we've been sort of playing around with how to get research out there quicker than going through, you know, um, journal articles can take years to get out. <laughs> and how do you get it out there but also make sure it's high quality, you know. I don't know, that's not really where you were getting mm -hmm. at, but well, maybe think well, about it's it. A, it's a failed concept because, you know, at one point, yeah, you know, it is the, you are providing something of value. But then there's also a time release to do that, so yeah. like a Doppler effect. Yeah. Um, you know, but that it, it, it does own up to like, you know, how do you stay 
I guess you like, you know, how, how, how have you guys found like the, the challenge to stay relevant as time goes on? And in terms of the product that you put out, whether it's after it's been out there for a while and you find that it might have been misinterpreted or if it's been interpret interpreted correctly or that it's still staying true to method message or if um, you know, or if subsequent analysis actually finds that that there needs to be adjustment to, to what was previously put out there, you know, you know, how do you is, is that a soft skill that you kind of have to learn as time goes on, or do you guys have like, any experiences around it where you had to tackle that at times? Well, I mean, for me to answer that, it's I can only answer that in my role, and I'm not a I'm not a researcher really anymore. So I'm much more, but my my data work and the work that I do with math is much more timely. Like I'm sort of on the, you know, it's like I need the answer now. What is the answer now? It's much more simple. It's not academic. It's not a big academic research study, but it's like, you know, here's the question. Go find me the answer and give me the answer now. And if the answer's, I mean, the in the, the preponderance of my product has to be right or I'm not really doing my job. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's maybe how I would say that. With that. I mean, it's a real different question with academic research and I think that's probably what your, where your question is geared. Um, you guys can probably speak to that better than me. Just to let you know, we're going to bring the food in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to bring And you can continue this conversation either this way or individually, however you'd like. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, sounds good. Thank you. And wait till you see the pie pie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, you ladies have any questions? Do other people have questions? Oh, sure. Um, hi, my name is Cindy. I'm a higher education master's student. Oh. And I'm not really on the statistics side, but um, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on like how to get more female students, like encourage them to major in math or like pursuing math or, or like the STEM um, subjects? That seems that yeah yeah, um, yeah I think it's um, I think if we can make math more meaningful and relatable more women will be drawn to the field I think a lot of females self-select out pretty early on um, and so I, I really do think that changing the way we teach math can open up not just to women but to all underrepresented um, populations in mathematics um, I think that you know being more open to what it means to be mathematical, you know, we have a certain definition of what that is, and if we can broaden that in our schools, um, that would make a big difference. Have we seen some improvement in that? We have seen some improvement. Yeah, there's been some improvement, yeah, and, um, you know, I recently read an article that said women are actually, you know, just as well prepared in the STEM fields, but they're choosing not to go into them because, you know, they're not, um, they don't perceive them as the kind of careers that they that they want, and so maybe it's the careers that need to change, not the education. You know, I mean, what is it about those jobs that makes it difficult for women to, to stay? In? I think that's a different question. You can continue conversation as we eat and drink as well. All right, shall we thank our panelists? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.